It is time to bring in David Teratruk with the Media Beat. Of course, uh, David joins us every Friday morning uh, with the Media Beat. Uh, but you can also find David at his own website, uh, which is themediabeat.us, themediabeat.us. US. And David is also a PBS television correspondent reporting on ethics and belief. But this morning, we're going to b go back in time just a little bit, a little bit, uh, 50 years, as a matter of fact, in David's role in the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Uh, good morning, David. Good morning. Yes, we're going back in time. Well, I, I thought that as, as much of the media is uh, getting so excited right now, convinced that the Russian collusion investigation is tightening around President Trump. Uh, I thought, oh, well, I've got a story, a Russian conspiracy story, uh, a Russian collusion story with a difference. But as you say, it, <laughs> fortunately, it is 50 years old, but it's all my own story. So I, I thought I'd tell it. Well, you know, it's. A, I think stories like this need to be told because... Uh, you know, you just have a country and I, you have a country now where uh, the millennials, which are coming into power and and deciding things. This this is ancient history to them. This is not something that they're really aware of, of what happened, how it happened and how it came about. Well, it's extra. Well, yeah. And, and, and of course, at the moment, the media generally is, is going crazy over uh uh, anniversaries because this is a particularly resonant resonant year. I mean, 2018 is now absolutely 50 years since 1968, and 1968 is getting an awful lot of attention. I mean, it, it, it for for a whole generation of uh, politicians, journalists, musicians, uh, it was a big happening year, and, and it, it it I mean, it, it's being it, great claims are being made for this year. The the, the Guardian, for instance, is is calling it. Uh, uh, 1968, the year of revolt. That's the banner they've got over all their stories about uh, their 50th anniversary uh, celebrations, if you like. And the Detroit Free Press um, is, it goes a little further. I mean, especially in, in a particularly American angle, really. It just says 1968, the year that transformed the nation. Well, and some people, I mean, I noticed that Le Monde in Paris was trying to make claims that 1968 transfer, transformed the world. It certainly transformed France if you remember, uh, riots in the streets of France, those historic cobblestones being dug up and uh, dug out of the street and, and uh, thrown at the riot police. Um, that was a student revolt with uh, a worker participation too, it, and it almost toppled, uh, was it the Third Republic? I can't remember what number they'd gotten to with President Charles de Gaulle, but um, it, it was in fact solved in the end, uh, but it was uh, a transformative transformative experience for that generation of young people in France. Now, how did you uh, set the stage how, how you got involved in being there and covering uh, this? Well, I wasn't there exactly. You know where I was in 1968? I was in Northern England, almost in Scotland. Uh, as you know, I, I'm a border boy. I come from that territory between England and Scotland. The, the, the town is Carlisle. I'd gone back there for <clears throat> what was my last summer of uh, university education? I'd, I'd gone back to my roots, if you like, because I, I felt that it might be easier in that far-flung region to get a uh, to get an internship, and I was right. I got an intern. I was already the uh, the editor of the university student newspaper, the undergraduate body's newspaper, uh, and I. Uh, I thought that this qualification entitled me to help out in um, journalism, you know, at the professional level. So I, I went to the regions. I went to my own region, the border. Uh, there was a company there with the uh, uninspiring title of Border Television, uh, headquartered in Carlisle, the, the last city in England before you cross the border into Scotland. And I, I was working as an intern, and, and like many an intern, my, my jobs were only just uh, making the making the tea. You don't make toffee. Well, maybe you do nowadays, but in those days, you didn't make didn't make coffee for the newsroom. You made tea for the newsroom. That's what I did. A little bit of uh, copy editing too. Uh, but things uh, changed suddenly when. The, the, our big uh, competitor, and I mean big, it was the BBC. This is a small commercial station, and, and our competitors were, or we were competitors with, uh, the BBC. 
massive organization. Anyway, they, they, they use their uh, uh, deep pockets to uh, poach one of our senior correspondents who, who up to left immediately without giving notice. Uh, so to counter this sudden deficiency in our talent, um, the station's talent, the, the news editor there, for reasons I'll never understand, but I'm forever grateful, put me on air as a roving reporter and an occasional in-studio interviewer and I remember I was 19 at this point I was pretty full of myself uh, <clears throat> there I was doing this extraordinary job uh, but, but you know in, in reality it was uh, it wasn't exactly highfalutin it was uh, agricultural shows we, we used to joke that we had more uh, sheep than human viewers in our territory <laughs> it was that kind of uh, of of, um, of uh, area for broadcasting, uh, so that was what I was doing. Uh, but then, on August twentieth, fifty years ago this week, Russian Soviet tanks rolled into Prague uh, to crush that uh, well-known period of reform in Czechoslovakia, known as the Prague Spring, one of the first springs uh, that we undergone internationally. Way back in 68, it was the Prague Spring, liberal reforms for Czechoslovakia initiated by the liberalizing uh, Czech leader, uh, Alexander Dubček, a, a name from the past, of course. Um, m as you say, many people will have forgotten that, that figure. I've been mean, towering in his time for being able to stand up against the uh, Soviet Union, except that well, he didn't win, of course. Now, what's that got to do with Carlisle, you may ask? Mm. Carlisle in the border region of Britain. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it so happened that two weeks previously, I would reported a short film about a work camp of international volunteers uh, who were doing this great job for uh, our area of uh, digging new ditches in the western part of the region. Um, and... Amongst all the young, idealistic, maybe idealistic, I don't know, but young, certainly young volunteers from all over the world that were working on this, uh, this work, um, was a young uh, Slovak teenager. She was called Nadezhda Bilakova. Ova, of course, is the feminine ending of the name. Her family name would have been Bilak. Uh, so I was back in my office two weeks later on August the 20th as, as, the, as the tanks were rolling across Czechoslovak borders and towards Prague. That happened in the middle of the night their time. It was the early evening our time. I read a Reuters wire story that, that talked about the, the, the official cover story that had been invented for this invasion by the Russians. They, the Moscow had come up with this uh, plot uh, early bit of Russian collusion, uh, a plot with uh, the Czechoslovak Communist Party hardliners who were against these liberal reforms. And they wrote a letter uh, claiming that uh, they needed to invite the Russians in. This was the Russians' excuse for, <clears throat> for launching this invasion. Uh, they felt that uh, Alexander Dubček's reforms were, quote, a danger to the very existence of socialism in our country. Uh, so that was the reason the Russians came in. But I noticed that one of the signatories to this, to this letter was a man called Bilak, Vasil Bilak. He was the leader of, of the uh, deeply conservative wing of uh, that Czechoslovakian the Communist Party, the Politburo, the leading uh, group. Um, he was the father of this girl that I'd interviewed just two weeks ago. So uh, I got on the phone, <coughs> made two calls, called my news editor, of course, saying, you won't believe this, but I've got the daughter of the man who invited the Russians in uh, on film from two weeks ago. Uh, and he, of course, he said, well, follow it up. Uh, so I called the work camp and said, can I speak to Nadezhda again? Nadezhda Bilak, Bilakova. And they told me I couldn't. She'd been taken away. And that's when the plot began to be unraveled because we discovered uh, that the previous evening, uh, two men in overcoats who spoke Russian and a bit of English uh, had arrived at the camp. And uh, the whole story was that they, they bundled Adesha away by car to Carlisle train station where they all boarded an overnight train to London. 
and thence to uh, Heathrow Airport. And a Russian Aeroflot flight uh, took her on to Moscow. And uh, some, some eyewitnesses at least said that uh, she seemed to be an unwilling traveler as these two men in raincoats sort of caricature characters out of the KBG, uh, I imagined at the time was what they were. Uh, anyway, the speculation was that um, Bilak, during his uh, discussions with the Soviet leader on August 18th, the Soviet leader being Le Leonid Brezhnev, a hard man of the time, do you remember? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and during that conversation, uh, Bilak said, look, my sister, my, 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 I'm sorry, not <laughs> getting a family relations wrong. Uh, my daughter, Nadezhda, is in the West as you launch this invasion, or is it this friendly exercise in our support? Um, and uh, we'd better get her out. So the KGB was dispatched to snatch her and bring her back to Moscow before the um, before the invasion was launched. So that's my little local regional angle in Britain on the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. But no. it goes to it speaks to something about how, the extent to which the Russians were capable of going to ensure that no loose ends were left as they launched this massive operation. Now, did you realize at that moment that that was the precursor for for the tanks rolling in? Oh, sure. The tanks were already rolling in when I discovered it. So it made total sense. Um, and, uh, you know, with the help of the national uh, news station, I, I mean, I got onto the national news that night. I mean, that was one of the big, uh, which is why it sticks in my mind. I, it was suddenly a big international story from our little corner in uh, Carlisle, England. Uh, so there I was. Um, I mean, I, 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 was, I reconstructed the whole journey of uh, uh, young Nadezhda with the, with the two Russians, the two mysterious Russians, a real cloak and dagger exercise. I mean, because that's, that's what it was. Um, there I was at uh, Carlisle Rail Station, um, the trains coming in and coming out, and, and I was able to recount the whole story and do that, that wonderful sign-off that I won't ever forget. It was David Terrester, News at 10, Carlisle Station. So I felt I was made. I mean, I was I was suddenly a, a, a television journalist without a doubt. Uh, now, how, how old were you? How old were you back then? That, that, I was nineteen. <laughs> man, now did, 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 this is going to sound like a stupid question, but I did did that really even invest you more in into what became your future and into becoming a reporter? Uh, that did, I mean, did that get your blood going even more? <laughs> The answer is yes, yeah. uh, absolutely, sure. I mean, I, I was uh, I was besotted with the profession at that point when I when I saw you know what from one little granular little yeah. um, event which was so humdrum, uh, I, I suddenly realised there were connections here and and this this uh, uh, part of our job which uh, which Jill is always stressing so much that I, you know part of our responsibility is to connect the dots. Uh, there I was doing it, and suddenly it was on an international map. Uh, and, and there I was, as I say, on, on Britain's national news um, at the tender age of 19. Uh, who wouldn't be uh, heady about that? And, and my head certainly was turned, and uh, I was determined. I mean, I very nearly didn't go back to university. I was so taken with this new job that I had, and I was, you know, I was in the clouds. Um, but in fact, um, you know, at, at the end of the summer, I, I did go back to college and I did get my degree. Uh, and, I, and then I had to look for a job in broadcasting. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting, you talk about this. Uh, you were a participant in this. And I, as a sophomore going into my junior year in high school, can remember watching the news reports. There's certain things that stand out to me about Russian invasions and stuff. One is when I was a kid. Uh, seeing the building of the Berlin Wall and seeing people shot as they tried to get over it. But the second, and I, I never knew, even as an adult, if the networks did this or not, but the, the, the showing of the tanks coming in and the audio of the, the tanks rumbling in sticks to, in my mind. And, and, and to this day, I always wondered, was that the actual audio from the tanks going in at that time? Or, or was it uh, just increased in, in something else? Because that audio and that video stuck in my mind of those tanks uh, to this day. 
Well, yes, it would. Um, and, and I can't speak for every individual station that would have carried that footage, whether they amped to the sound or not. But uh, I, I do, I mean, I have, from the time, I remember, uh, and of course, I, I, I researched the, the eyewitness accounts from Prague, too, to match in with the, <clears throat> the story I was working on, the, the immediate story I was working on. And of course, I've retained an interest in that whole event ever since. Uh, what was so remarkable is about that they were they were very heavy tanks uh, coming in. It was an extraordinary uh, devotion of uh, of military hardware to uh, essentially uh, to quell essentially a civilian population. There was no military resistance. Um, I mean, it would have been complete folly for the for the Czechs minimally armed army to to stand up attempt to stand up to the Soviet army and so what you got were these this incredible noise of those ancient sidewalks and, and roadways of uh, Prague being crumbled yep. uh, with the tanks rolling through them and the extraordinary pictures that went along that of, of, of the of the popular of, of the popular reaction the, the, the people's reaction there's a photograph that accompanies my my web uh, piece to, today of, of an elderly woman reaching her hands up in, in a kind of pleading motion to the Russian officers who were in the um, turret of the huge tank staring down at her. It's an extraordinary image. And, of course, there were many very striking journalistic images from that event. I mean, R Russia was, uh, was of course, a, a, a behemoth at the time, and, and its satellite nations around it, the Soviet bloc, so-called, the Warsaw Pact, which opposed NATO. Uh, Czechoslovakia was a, was a very uh, minor part of that, and, and it was the classic David and Goliath. In this case, um, the Goliath was winning, uh, and for a while it did, I mean, until the late 80s when the Soviet Union collapsed and uh, uh, President uh, Vaclav Havel came to the fore, a kind of spiritual descendant of uh, Dubček. Uh, liberal reforms really happened finally in, the, in Czechoslovakia, and then, of course, divided into its two separate nations, um, in a, you know, with, with, with democratic apparatus for their governance now. You know, it's interesting you use the term Soviet Union. Today, millennials wouldn't know, would what, know that what that was that because is. it was not Russia. Every map, when you were taught in school, every it was Soviet Union. It wasn't Russia. And the the other thing is they'd be mystified at Czechoslovakia. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. And, I've been and, using the adjective in my piece this week, Czechoslovakia. And it's a, it's a long and difficult uh, adjective. And, of and, course, now it, it's split back again into its constituent parts. It was always fun to learn how to spell. But my favorite from your reporting and your sign-off in Carlisle is just transfer it 50 years on. You know, you didn't have – there's video footage of everything now. And there was uh, yes. I, I mean, I've looked for that moment, and, and of course, in in, in uh, British archives, and of course, it's 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 long since trashed. It was a piece of piece of sixteen millimeter film with separate sound, and uh, yeah, no, not archived. Yeah. And um, I long unfortunately, for the, I long for those days though, because when they used video back then, they never looped it. <laughs> <laughs> But that's Actually, a huge... in our station, we did not have a video. <laughs> but but that loop. There was no such thing as a video recording. Right. Um, there was all. It was either live in the studio or. Uh, actually, sometimes we had outside. No, we didn't even have outside broadcast, live outside broadcast cameras. We had uh, 16 millimeter news film, and, and you had to uh, run back to the studio with it um, from whatever remote location you were at. Well, the thing about looping... Black and white, of course, too. Of course. <laughs> which is, which is again, you know, it seems so Jurassic, except that sometimes, as, as any auteur knows, it can be quite compelling. Um, but what Marshall's point about the loop, since that's uh, the precursor of the echo chamber, I believe, um, is... Well, the constant replaying of the same... Uh, the same scene without changing the footage, time. Yeah, or, you as, know, as if it were happening now, but in fact it was... Yeah, it's r running again and again and yes, again. Yes, I can't see. Hallmark of cable news, which, as you say, is is a huge plays a huge part in our desensitizing ourselves but also what to what is what is real and what is current and what is and what is not. What has remained a standard, and I, and and it's still standard to this day. Uh, the radio broadcast that I heard uh, during the, the Berlin Wall and during the invasion of Czechoslovakia uh, always were 
this is the one thing about radio. It is so immediate and it is so there, and the reporting is is so so real uh, that it it brings you right to the place where uh, sometimes looking at video, uh, it's almost like nowadays looking at a game where when you've got a reporter out there uh, doing something and it's there and it's the actual moment. It's pretty amazing. And, and in fact, thinking about your memories of uh, as, as a youngster of the. Uh, Czechoslovak invasion is that uh, you may well be remembering what you heard on radio because what I what I do remember is that the radio reporters at the time uh, did the obvious thing yeah. they just pointed their microphones towards the huge caterpillar tracks of those tanks rolling through the town rolling through the the, the, the city streets so uh, yeah you would you would be very aware of that immediacy that uh, radio can achieve just by ex- that extraordinary sound being uh, captured uh, live. But does it amaze you that uh, even though some 50 years has passed, a lot of ch- a lot has changed in international politics, but a lot has stayed the same? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, we look over five decades and you, you can see patterns repeating themselves. And, and uh, you know, this easy uh, phrase we use all the time that people who don't pay attention to history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, but, I mean, it, it repeats itself anyway, whether people pay attention or not. Right. Uh, it's, just, it's just the paying attention to it, even if it's, you know, what you have to do is find some period that you resonate with because then you can see the patterns more easily. And it just certainly widens your lens if, if, if you're willing to look at it that way. I was wondering, David, when you were really young, when I was young, I used to listen to radio. And, and it wasn't called all talk or news radio, but I used to listen with my dad, especially in the summer. Uh, and they were always interview and long-form programs. And for me, uh, for me, the information that, that I received uh, really formed me going into a career many, 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 many years later simply because I was always amazed that you could listen to a broadcast and you could hear the reports from Berlin, you could hear it from Czechoslovakia, you could hear from Washington, D.C., and it was real time, it was right there, and that, that always grabbed me back then. Because you could learn did, stuff. Did, 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 what, what, is that what's, what really formulated you to, go, to get into media? Was it, was, it, was, it, was it witnessing events happening and saying, you know, I'd like to cover those? Uh, sure, I, I, and what uh, what helped a lot when I was uh, when I was a student, and, and I, I, as I said, I, I got into uh, journalism for the <clears throat> for the student body, as, you know, a smallish community that I was serving as a reporter, and then later on as the editor of the paper. It was a, it, basically it, it helped me f- perform a role in society. I, I, I happened to be a very very um, uh, re- retiring, very withdrawn, shy uh, adolescent. And uh, it was almost a, a prescription for myself to get over that. What I did was join the newspaper in order to force myself to go out and talk to people. That's what reporters do, right? That's uh, right. And, and it, was, it seemed a perfect way of sort of finding a role in society that was useful and also dealt with my shyness. And, and uh, you know, nowadays I, I find it relatively easy to walk down the street with a microphone and ask people's, people questions. Uh, I'm, I'm still a little nervous about it every time I do it. But uh, that, that was, that, I mean, it was, it was a way of, of getting to the heart, I think, of what my, my, my job as a journalist is. I mean, I, I'm still doing what I did. It's, it's no surprise to me that it's the sort of thing that young people, students especially, want to do. It's an extension of, of what you're doing when you do your studies. I, I want to find something out. I go out and find it by talking to people and, and, and reading, of course. Uh, and I try to make the best sense of it that I can. I come back and, and I use my megaphone or whatever kind it is, radio, television, the web, uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, to tell the public what I've learned. And for this, we are, at the very least, eternally grateful. <laughs> well, it? I'm grateful too. I'm glad for the chance to do it. Thank so, you. Thank you very much, David Tereschuk, The Media Beat.